Border workers in Canada extend strike deadline until Friday. Investigation by CBC finds prisoners in Hamilton spent more time in solitary confinement. Senior Alberta NDP MLA resigns. UN backs call for ceasefire in Gaza and an update on Europe's continuing descent into fascism. Good morning. It's Tuesday, June 11th. I'm Nora. Here are your headlines. The union representing border workers has extended its strike deadline until Friday. They are a component of the Public Service Alliance of Canada. The union has been in talks with the federal government to reach a tentative agreement for the 9,000 Canada Border Services Agency workers it represents. The workers have been without a contract for two years. The union is calling for pay parity with other law enforcement agencies, among other things. 90% of CBSA workers are considered essential, meaning they can't go on strike, but they can work to rule. Despite this, the union points out that a 2021 strike caused massive delays at airports and land crossings and caused disruption in border crossing commercial traffic. In a press statement, the union's president, Sharon D'Souza, said the union is, quote, still hopeful we can avoid a strike and potential disruptions at Canada's borders, unquote, by the Friday deadline. And I would be remiss to not mention that this is like the only union in Canada that has ever issued a press release condemning me personally. So, you know, uh, solidarity, I guess. They, they were they were mad that I was daring to talk about anti-racism for white people. You can find it if you're super curious. It's a really long press release, and I'm not forgetting that. Next, a CBC investigation by Bobby Hristova out of Hamilton found that prisoners there spent more time in solitary confinement than anywhere else in Ontario. The story analyzes data showing that the practice has been increasing in Ontario prisons since 2019, with Hamilton being the worst. Between April 2022 and March 2023, 1,408 prisoners were put in solitary confinement in that city's prison. 504 of those people had a mental health alert on their file, with 223 people having been on suicide watch. Solitary confinement has been shown to exasperate mental health conditions and increase the risk of suicide. The data also shows that in Hamilton, prisoners were, in some cases, held in solitary confinement for more than 21 days. Under the UN's Mandela rules, solitary confinement for 15 days and over is considered a form of torture. This also goes against a 2019 ruling by Ontario's Court of Appeal, which had set a hard 15-day cap on solitary confinement. The UN Special Rapporteur on Torture has been calling for an end to the practice since 2011, while the Ontario Human Rights Commission has asked the province to phase it out since 2016. Next to Alberta, where NDP MLA Shannon Phillips announced that she's resigning her seat effective July 1st. The former environment minister cited the, quote, coarsening of political discourse, unquote, and police surveillance as her reasons for stepping down. In 2017, Phillips was overheard by a cop in public discussing proposals for a new park in her constituency. The officer, Keon Warnock, later posted a picture of Phillips on Facebook under a false name, criticizing her and the NDP government, which caused her to report him to the police. That's pretty awkward. The police investigated Warnock and discovered that he had conducted an unauthorized database search related to Phillips. Warnock was convicted of five counts of violating the Police Services Act. A different cop, Jason Carrier, was also convicted on two counts of the same act for helping Warnock and not reporting him. Late last month, the province's police watchdog, the Alberta Serious Incident Response Team, said that while the two officers had committed crimes by illegally surveilling Phillips, the threshold for prosecution had not been met. Next, the U.N. Security Council passed a resolution that supported the three-part U.S. ceasefire plan and that called on Hamas to accept it. This is the same three-phase plan that Biden announced last month, which he had said was an Israeli plan that Israeli officials had then promptly distanced themselves from, saying they would not accept it. Hamas said at the time that they viewed the plan positively and responded similarly today to the resolution, stating that it was prepared to cooperate with mediators on its implementation. 
The U.S. said on Monday that Israel had agreed to this plan, though Israeli officials had not confirmed or denied this as the time of writing this script. As a reminder, the three-part plan includes first, safe distribution of humanitarian assistance, second, a cessation of hostilities, and finally, a reconstruction plan for Gaza and the return of hostages still in Gaza, and the total withdrawal of Israeli troops from the territory. The resolution passed at the Security Council 14 to 0, with Russia abstaining. And finally, Europe's descent into fascism became even more apparent as the result of the European parliamentary elections rolled in. These elections allow EU citizens to decide who they want to represent them in the European Parliament, where laws governing the EU are passed. They are held every five years and are based on proportional representation. In this year's election, far-right parties made significant gains, causing a ripple effect through European domestic politics. Starting with France, Marine Le Pen's party now has twice as many seats as current French President Emmanuel Macron's party in the European Parliament. This caused Macron to call an inexplicable snap election in his country. That should work. Moving to Germany, where the far-right alternative for Germany beat German Chancellor Olaf Scholz's center-left SPD to take the second place with 16% of the vote. Finally, in Italy, Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni's extreme right party won the most ballots, gaining four times more than what it had in the 2019 election. Now, fascinatingly, if you look at how Israelis who had French citizenship voted, they all voted for the far rightist, farest right parties, which is not that surprising, though perhaps a little surprising that not all settler states vote the same way. French people living in Quebec, or as you say in French, les Français, voted for a majority of left-wing parties. So, I don't know, vive le Québec, France libre, I guess. Those are your headlines for Tuesday, June 11th. I'm Nora. You're listening to this podcast at sandynora.com on the Real News Network podcast feed and anywhere you get your podcasts. It's Tuesday. It's Sandy and Nora Day. Uh, I have to be honest with you, as of the time of me recording this, we haven't actually recorded this week's episode. With our travel schedules and my birthday, it has just not been possible. So if there's no episode that drops in a couple of hours, something happened. And if in a couple of hours you're listening to something, know that it's super fresh.